What is, is ASP.NET? Simply put, it's a framework for building websites. Um, it's built on the .NET framework, so you can actually write anything in this that is supported in .NET. Um, any, any CLR language, there's like VB, C Sharp, there's actually a whole list of them. Um, if you just do a quick search for CLI languages, you'll find that you can actually write things in Pascal, COBOL, uh, C++, .NET. Uh, we're going to be focusing on C Sharp for today, though. I know most of you guys learn C++. C Sharp isn't too different from that, so the code should be very familiar to you. We're going to use these languages to build websites, and they're actually going to run on the .NET framework, so um, they will work. Just awesome. It kind of gives the feel of building a, a win form, but it's actually a website. It's kind of a, in the quasi-state between um, a website where you have a client and a server, but um, I guess going back and forth between them, it's as you write the code, you have a front end and you have a back end, much like you would build a regular web form. I'm sorry, a regular win form. Um, this uh, this kind of weird feeling between it has it can be a little bit misleading. Um, we're actually going to cover the page lifecycle soon, which will get rid of all of that confusion, where you have um, it actually splits apart when the client is actually talking to the server and which processing is done on which section. Or, I guess the pages that you build are split apart into two halves. You have an ASPX page, which is the front end that you would do all of your designing on this page, and you have your code behind. This again can be a, a C sharp thing, a VB script. Um, it's just any code behind that will run for this file. The separation is nice because it separates the business logic from the display. It's also very nice because you can have um, more than one people working on the same page at the same time. Uh, you can have your design person laying out the website uh, and they can focus on uh, where controls should be laid out, what color things should be, and how the page itself should flow from one page to another. And you can have your, uh, your coder working behind the scenes, doing all the business logic, wiring up all the buttons and the labels, everything to actually make the front end work. It would actually be putting in your, your queries if you want to read from a database, or um, just how the controls want to interact with each other. The other nice thing is that <laughs> these pages aren't restricted to using Visual Studio. This is Microsoft Blend for Visual Studio 2012, just an example here. Um, this is not part of Visual Studio, but you can still read your, uh, your pages and you can do all of your designing in here. Note how this is not Visual Studio, though. Um, any other application that can read the, these ASPX pages or HTML pages or whatever other design thing you'd be using for your websites, it can all be done in a tool like this. Um, this tool is actually very nice for this sort of a thing because it's not based on the code. It, the focus on this thing is more on the design of the page. So again, the ASPX page is the design view. It's describing just the layout of the page. And the code behind page is where you put all of your business logic. Um, things like making new queries and showing hiding paid selections. Now we're going to talk a bit about how requests to the server are actually made. Uh, so we know kind of the pieces at this point, but how do they actually play together? You have your client and your server. The client would be, for example, all of your laptops, and your server would be the place that's actually hosting the website. Just a quick description of the, what actually happens here, you would go to a website in your browser and you would make a request to the server, like go up to www.d3solutions.com. Your browser is saying to the, to the server, I would like to view this web page. The server then takes that request, looks up what page it's supposed to display, turns whatever it needs to into HTML, and then gives that back to the browser. The browser would then render that. I have a nice picture. Uh, as you can see up here, it starts with the client. The server would then receive that request <laughs> and then uh, render the page for you. Um, we're going to go into some detail about how it actually renders the page in just a bit here. Um, so we'll kind of leave that one a bit open-ended. Uh, but once it's done rendering the page, it then returns to the browser and displays it, or the client displays it. So the page lifecycle. Um, one of the interesting things about ASP.NET is that your pages only exist during the lifetime of that request. They're actually destroyed once you're done. Um, this, the page lifecycle is a process of turning one of these requests into HTML or something that a browser will understand. This is just a picture. You don't have to memorize this thing. This is really just to show you. Um, 
everything that's involved with these page life cycles. There's a whole bunch of events that happen. You can tie into or have code happen at pretty much any one of these events in here. Um, we're going to be focusing more on this middle column here. Uh, not covering all of them, just most of them. Because that's where you can do most of your code. We're going to start with pre-init. Pre-init is one of the very first things that you can actually attach to. Um, very shortly after the browser receives a request from a client, and it's actually going to kick off the uh, rendering process here. Um, this is the part that actually brings in the page. It, it creates the page that you're supposed to, or that the, the browser knows that it's supposed to render. And in here, it actually starts initializing some of the controls. Um, this is one of the sections where you can actually start creating new controls and bring them in before the page actually exists. Um, you can do things like create dynamic controls in here. You can set a master page. We'll get into what that is for uh, a little later down the line. You can set a theme. A theme is um, really just a set of styling you, uh, that can be applied to all the pages in there. You can pick and choose which one you want at that time. And um, the initialized page content, you can do that before the actual init. So this is before the page actually starts loading itself in. The next step would be the init. So after our pre-init and after our controls have actually been created, uh, the init happens. The init will then take these created controls and start loading them up with whatever properties they need. <coughs> uh, this is also happens after any styling stuff has been applied. Um, like the themes that we just mentioned, those will be loaded in, and then in the init is where you can start interacting with how the page, these uh, controls now look. Um, this is something that happens right before load, so uh, I guess it's before it's actually brought into the page. Um, this is also the last chance you can do anything before the view state is loaded. Well, as most of this stuff is controls that we will be talking about in a bit, but all of these init and pre-init concepts here is basically everything that happens before you can start doing things on your page. It's um, mainly used for basically setting the stage for how you want to draw your page. Now we get into the load. Uh, one of the very first methods that you'll notice when you start interacting with a page is a page load, or on load, or a control load. Uh, when load happens, it happens on the page, and then it recursively calls load for every other control on that page. So if you have a control on the page, and that control contains other ones, for example, like a button inside of a table, the table's load is called first, and then the button's load is called after that. In here is where you'd actually start loading in some data. At this point, or everything up until this point has been initializing the controls just to make them, um, to bring them into proper environments we actually can start using them. At this point, we would actually start uh, filling them up with data, for example, doing a database query and then putting those results onto the page. After the load, we then start processing any event that would have happened in our page. For example, if you had clicked a button or uh, changed a checkbox or anything else that would be on a page, we start processing those um, and actually processed in the order that they happened. So for example, if you checked a checkbox, then filled in a label, or I guess filled in a text box, and then hit a button, um, but it didn't actually go back to the server until you hit that button, you would process these events in that same order. So after we handle all of the control events, we now start talking about, the, or we now start pre-rendering. This isn't actually drawing the controls yet. That will come in, in just a bit. This is the last chance that we have to change anything before we actually start drawing these controls. After the pre-render is the render. Now this isn't actually an event. It's more of a concept. Uh, this is the action of taking all of the controls that we've just set up until this point and turning them into HTML. Um, you can override render and have, I guess, you can have a control rendered in a specific way that you want. You can change up however you want this stuff drawn, or you can make a whole new control that draws however you would like it to draw. If you're creating a custom control, you want to use this method because that'll actually uh, determine how it shows up on the page. And this is one of the important ones that just happens it, it just happens behind the scenes, but you do have to be aware that this actually happens. Um, after we've drawn the page, we now unload our, our page. This is um, actually taking this thing out of memory, start to destroy all the controls, because the page is destroyed after every request. It's actually kind of convenient because you don't have to worry about cleaning up anything. 
Um, but this is where you would go through and uh, I guess disconnect any connections you have to the database. Uh, you can also write to a file if you really want to there. Any sort of logging would be done in here. Um, but this is the thing that happens right before the page is actually destroyed. Um, at this time, though, you're actually done rendering, so you can't make any changes to the response stream at this time. Um, Andy, of course, would go and find a couple different ways around this one, as he corrected me earlier. But um, there are some... This is the last chance you get before the page is actually destroyed. And here's a link for you. Um, there's a lot more information on these page life cycles. As you saw from the picture earlier, that's actually where I got this, um, this picture from. There's a lot of detail in these events. Um, they all happen in very specific orders. But the ones that I just showed you are the ones that are the main events that happen.